Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all being here for today for a wonderful talk with Paula Lynch. My name is Rachel Boveja. I am a career coach with the Walter Center for Career Achievement, focusing on students working in international studies and global studies, and specifically have a background research in refugee health and diplomacy. So I am very excited to be here and introduce Paula Lynch for you all today. Paula is the director of the Office of Policy and Resources Planning with the Bureau of Population, Refugees and migration with the U.S. Department of State. So she will be joining us uh, via call today, but we will still be making use of the chat so that we can um, have Paula introduce herself and hopefully have you all ask some questions about her career path and um, for your future career path as well. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here with us, Paula. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really thrilled to be here. I was happy to come out last April for the uh, Amer America's Role in the World Conference. I think I got that right. And uh, so it's fun to have this, this chance to follow up a little bit. I, I kind of giggle when people say, you know, your career path, because one of the things that I think my career has is no visible path. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot of making choices as they come up. And I think that's one lesson that I would say is, a, is it's an alternative that I think works. And it doesn't mean that it's the best. Some people have different ideas. I have a good friend that has had a five-year plan every year of her life, and she's risen very well and had a very successful career. So you can do it either way. I have tended to uh, choose things as they come available and take chances from time to time, and it's worked out. Um, I, I will say that I studied overseas uh, in Germany, and I was in love with somebody who uh, got in the Foreign Service, and so I married the Foreign Service at age 21, and that was in 1975. And I've been, as I say, married to the State Department ever since. Uh, I'm no longer married to that person, but uh, in any case, I was, I was, I joined when it was three years. 1975 was three years after uh, women had been told that. Uh, they could actually be an FSO alongside their husband before they only would allow a husband to be and the woman couldn't be unless she was single. So that changed in 1972. And uh, so that kind of gives an indication of how the State Department has changed in the way it deals with, uh, with people. Um, I think well, we can go in a whole bunch of different directions, but I don't want to take up too much time before we get to questions. So I lived in a bunch of different places as a Foreign Service wife, and I came in the Foreign Service in 1980, and uh, you have to write an essay in the Foreign Service, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. In my essay, I said I really wanted to do things to help other people, and I said that I loved politics. And international relations in particular, the international politics. And that's been really um, what I've been able to do, which I'm, I feel myself extremely lucky. I've been working, as you can calculate, if you can do math, I've been working for 42 years for the State Department. And the reason I have stayed working is because I absolutely love the work. So I've been very lucky that I can feel like I'm doing something good with my work and it's extremely political and and fascinating for that reason. Um, so in 1980, the Refugee Act of 1980 had just been passed. Uh, it was prompted largely by the Vietnam War and the large number of Vietnamese that we resettled in this country. Um, the Refugee Programs Bureau had just been established. That's what PRM is now. Uh, and it meant that humanitarian work was a good fit with me and I seemed to fit with it because they needed new staff and they had just been created. So I did that. I've, I've also worked in some other areas. Uh, most of them have a link to refugees. They, they all have been humanitarian in nature. Um, so I've done that over time. I can go into anything anybody wants to talk about. I've been posted in Rwanda. Uh, I lived in, as a Foreign Service wife in Senegal. Um, I've also lived in Vancouver, Canada and also Geneva, Switzerland, where I've worked on uh, our relationship with the major refugee agencies uh, that are there. 
Um, I, I switched to civil service in 1987 after having two children and decided that I was not mentally prepared to pick up, <laughs> pack up a whole, an entire family every two to three years. Uh, that's one thing that makes me say my personal advice is uh, join the, if you're going to join the Foreign Service, do it while you're young. Um, it'll be a lot easier to move around. Uh, you have a lot fewer demands. Um, you know, you want your children to have the best education possible. And, you know, you have to make choices about what is a good education. In some cases, we say that living overseas is a brilliant education. In some cases, it's not very easy for the kids, though. So you have to be, you have to think that through as you go. Um, and that's one of the things that prompted me to say, mm, I think I'll go back to the United States now and I have one fewer thing to worry about. Um, aside from that, then I, I switched to civil service because there's a lot more depth in humanitarian assistance that one needs to know in order to do a good job as a government employee. There's a lot of overall diplomacy that uh, that you don't need as much depth in a country. You've got a, a very broad depth in diplomacy writ large, and you can do that job in any one of many countries. For humanitarian assistance, there's a bit more uh, in-depth expertise required. And so we have a lot more civil service jobs than we do foreign service jobs. However, we have what we call ref cords, refugee coordinators, overseas in over 25 countries now, I think. And they are all foreign service officers. So, uh, so we do have foreign service that work on refugee issues and, and internally displaced and, and such. I think maybe I should stop there and see if there are some questions. How about that? So everyone, I put in the chat. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yes, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat, um, or we can also um, allow you to turn on your mic. And I also have some I'd questions. Love to hear yeah. Okay, I'd love to hear voices. Um, so if you want to turn on your mic and and just ask a question, that'd be great. But why don't we start with uh, with what you had in the chat? Okay, so far we don't have any in the chat, but I have some to get you all going. Oh, nope, there we go. Thank you, Molly. So Molly has a question. Was there a specific catalyst to get into this career for you? Well, the catalyst was that I was in love with somebody that joined the Foreign Service. And so I got married and, and joined it myself. But I, I have to say that it has been a really perfect career for me. I, you may not know, I, I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, and I felt like I, I was connected to the international community because of all the international students that there were and professors at IU. Um, my brothers and I had uh, kids from other countries in our classes, not, not like 90%, certainly nothing like that, but uh, we did know of families that came from other countries. And so there was sort of a vibe of an international uh, thing in Bloomington. I, 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 like I went to IU for 18 years, so I ended up not going to IU for college myself. I had already gone uh, for some summer school and stuff, um, but I, I, went, uh, I went to Vanderbilt. But anyway, um, there I had a professor that came out of the Foreign Service, so I kind of learned a little bit about that. But... Um, it was being overseas when my then uh, my husband to be was assigned uh, not far away from me, and we decided that was uh, that was fate telling us we should get married. So we did. Um, so that's I, I don't know what to say in terms of uh, what how that answers your question. When I follow up, that's okay too. Yes, as we wait for um, either Molly to follow up or some other questions, um, thanks for telling us a little bit about your personal story, Paula, because you bring your whole self to work. This is something we talk about a lot in our careers. And um, just you mentioned earlier about 
choosing things as they come available. And um, right now our students, many of our students have taken courses in the pandemic and a lot of the jobs they were looking for are no longer available and a lot of new jobs are available now. So do you have any advice, just to follow up with Molly's questions, do you have any advice or recommendations for students who might know exactly what they want to do right now, but as they go into their career may need to pivot at some point. Like you said, whether it has to do with personal relationships, uh, family planning, or just new opportunities. Well, that's a good point. Uh, that's a very good question. I I think um, I, I think that there are some things that are if, if you want to get involved in international relations let's not say State Department necessarily, but including the State Department, uh, it really helps to have some international experience. So that can come in any number of ways. One of my favorites is the Peace Corps because uh, it's not impossible to get into. And you, you really do learn the basics from, you know, sort of from the ground up about uh, how a country operates, how it works. And you get immersed into a different culture. Um, I remember from last year, that, or from last spring when I was out there, that many of you have been immersed in different cultures, and perhaps Bloomington, Indiana is a different culture uh, for you. So I get that. Um, but I think Peace Corps is a, a, a good way to start. You are connected to the embassy wherever you are. You can sort of see how things go there, if that's what you want to get involved in. Um, another way of getting international experience is to uh, work for a non-governmental organization and do work overseas, which isn't quite volunteer work, but the pay is about as good as volunteer work. It's not the way to make a lot of money. But again, you are doing something that is more specific sometimes than Peace Corps, but you get the experience of being overseas, learning a language, living in a different culture. And I think that that has a lot of value regardless of where your career takes you in terms of international affairs. Thank you very much for that. So I hope you all heard that, right? So getting overseas, getting some international experience, um, which Paula, you mentioned, we know a lot of our students have that, so continuing to get that experience. We have a couple of other questions coming up in the chat. And remember, Paula's okay with you all turning on your mics if you would rather speak that way. But we can go ahead and start with Sarah. Thank you. Can you elaborate more on the difficulties with traveling or moving so much for your job and how you coped with those transitions? Well, I will say that when I lived in Rwanda, I went out there with a nine week old baby and I came back pregnant with my second son. So I had a two-year-old. Uh, they were almost three years apart when they were finally both born. Um, and packing up all the stuff was really difficult. Um, you, don't, you, you really do have to do it yourself, mostly. Uh, but I think one thing that will be an advantage for your generation is that uh, I think most people that are your generation have a lot less stuff than I did, uh, or than I do now for sure. I, I, I'm overwhelmed with stuff right now. But um, I think living small is something that is uh, a little bit more attuned with the way this, gener this new generation uh, is accustomed. And so maybe it'll be easier. Um, I think the, the issues of your family are, are things you have to take very seriously. Um, when I was in Rwanda, I was the working spouse, and my husband then was the stay-at-home dad. And that meant there were, you know, stresses on him because most of the other stay-at-home people were women. Uh, we, weren't, we were pretty out there doing a woman working and a man staying at home. So that was, that was uh, from 83 to 85, 1983 to 1985 um, in Rwanda. So... I think, but the, the overall thing that, you know, you have to pay attention to the mental health of everybody in the family is important. Um, I think also uh, there are differences between large organizations and small organizations. In a small organization, as long as everybody gets along well and 
you know, has fun together and works well together, you're, you're fine. But if you don't, you don't have a lot of option in a small organization. You may have a lot more responsibility and be able to take on more, um, more authority and, 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 you know, tasks and taskings and stuff like that. And that may be good for your career, but you really, uh, I would advise if you can make sure that the people you're working with are people that you get along with, that would be a really good thing to do first before you just go land someplace and, and go in a larger organization. For example, uh, in, in a larger embassy, you can get stuck, uh, doing, one job repeatedly over and over and over again, and that's that's not as much fun. But you have a much broader uh, community of people that you're that you're working with, and so sometimes that might be a better thing, just because you know you've got a, a broader choice of people to to pick as uh, colleagues that you like or friends or whatever. And you don't have to. I mean, all your friends in the world don't have to be uh, colleagues, but I think that does tend to happen when you're in the foreign service that you do end up with a lot of friends that are not people that you work with. Does that answer that a little bit? Anyone you want to follow up? That's fine too. I'm happy to have a conversation. Thank you, Paula. And yes, everyone, please feel free to join in in the conversation and if you have follow up questions and, and thank you for talking about just the well rounded experience and the impact on the family right because there's the impact that's on you, the decisions you have to make in your mental health. But as you mentioned, when you have a family um, and just when you're working with others in general, you have to keep everyone's mental health in mind. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I know that that mental health is um, something we're all learning a lot more about when it comes to careers these days. So thank you. We do well, have a- Because of the pandemic. It's, mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And you guys, uh, have been through college during a pandemic, which I hope nobody else will have to go through. But that's a that's a daunting thought to me. It's, I, I can't imagine what that's been like for you. So, um, absolutely. We'll go to the next question, I guess. Well, yeah. absolutely, right. And this is a strength that you all have too that you can build upon because you're you're dealing with something that a lot of us. Well, haven't had to deal with, and Paul, like Paula said, hopefully will not have to deal with, right? Um, with that, though, Paula, as a follow-up question about the pandemic, do you what do you feel has changed with the Foreign Service or within diplomacy work um, since the pandemic? Well, one thing that has changed is that we have switched over to working uh, online in an enormous way. I mean, we we could hardly do anything from home before the pandemic. And now we can do almost everything. I mean, we have two systems. One's the classified system and one is the uncla or unclassified system. And uh, of course, for the classified system, we have to be in the office. But, uh, but my job doesn't require very much classified work. So I can do almost all my work at home. And that's been really amazing. And so as the job structure of, I think, our country and maybe of the whole world, not quite the whole world, but of a lot of countries, is moving to a lot of working from home. Um, that's happening at the State Department, too. Right now, my office, which has about 30 people in it, has two people working out of Seattle, Washington, one working out of Texas, and one working out of Florida. And it's pretty amazing. We, we keep forgetting that you know, we, we want to do something in person and then, oh yeah, that's right. Some people can't attend in person because they're not even around here. But we go ahead and do things in person that are casual, you know, that are fun. But we need to make sure that every meeting we have, we've got the ability to have people online. So, so that works for the Washington, D.C. area stuff. Uh, I think it was We've been through quite a, a quite a cycle overseas. I think um, when the pandemic first came out, I, now I have to say that I'm not speaking from authority. I'm speaking from what I remember, and that <laughs> that's not necessarily the best source. But uh, it seemed like a lot of our colleagues were being evacuated out of the places that they were and being brought back to the states. And of course, with the, as we grew 
in our ability to work online and remotely, that was okay. We could have the embassy for someplace, be located someplace else. Uh, like right now, our embassy for Kabul is located in Doha. So you've got the ability to, to change your location, um, but that does reduce the number of in-person meetings you're going to have. And regardless of how good we all are on Zoom or uh, WebEx or Teams, it's not this, it's not exactly the same as meeting in person. That doesn't mean one is better than the other, but it does mean they're different. And so um, I think it's it's worth acknowledging that. And and in diplomacy, I think we normally have defined diplomacy as being something that one does in person. It's very hard to imagine uh, that you would do it all online. But you know, I, then I contradict myself and go back and think, well, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were in Europe during the revolution, and they did a whole lot of reporting and, and diplomacy uh, in letters. So, but they did meet with the, the diplomats uh, in person. Anyway, uh, it, it's different. It's it's important, but it's not the only way to get anything done. Let me say it that way. Hi, Paula. This is Heather. How are you? I'm fine, Heather. How are you? I'm great, thanks. We have a question in the chat from Megan Gearhart, who is um, who works with me, and she wanted to know if there was a time in your career when you regret a decision you made. And what do you wish you knew during that decision-making process that would have changed the final outcome you came to? Holy cow. Hey, can I apologize about uh, that? I think I was, my mute was on. Sorry, what? I just jumped in because Rachel accidentally had her mute on. So anyway. Oh, oh, oh. And she okay. was apologizing. All right. No worries at all. Okay. No, that's, that's okay. Okay. Um, Certainly, I, I haven't made every decision well. I think the, the decisions that I have tended to have not turn out the best are some of my hiring decisions, and that's because I am not um, tough enough. I tend to like somebody, and I get to, you know, I, I meet them, and I think, oh, this is a really nice person, and and then I, I forget to really drill down into do they have the skills we need in this office to do this or that and the other. So the way I've coped with that is I turn hiring over to other people and I'm happy to be part of an interview panel, which I'm on many times, but I don't want to have to make the final decision because I have made some that I thought were boners in the past and I think, okay, well, it won't be that again. But anyway, those are the ones that come immediately to mind. I'm sure there are other decisions, I, I, but I have to say that in a bureaucracy, there's, there's so many times that you are contributing to a decision, you're not actually the decision maker. And even the person who signs, you know, approve on whatever approve, disapprove memo you send, there's a lot of input into it. And so um, I feel like you don't have as many difficulties um, that they come back to you personally. There, there are a lot of people that help uh, or, or make it a, a bureaucratic process. I mean, it, that's, it's not always fun, but there's, a, there's not a lot of personal, um, personal responsibility sounds terrible for me to say there's not a lot of it. There is personal responsibility, but it's for how you behave. It's not for how a policy comes out. Let me say it that way. Um, but so on the on the personal responsibility, I don't really think I can think of anything that I've made horrible decisions on. Um, I've been pretty good, I think. I'm pretty transparent. Um, so pretty honest. I try to be forthright with everybody. Um, I talk too much, but <laughs> that's, that's Not too bad. I mean. Not at all. And we're also exactly. hearing just about your, you said being honest and forthright and authentic in your experiences with others. 
Yeah. I, I think that, I, I think, I, I finally learned that if you try to avoid saying things that are true, you end up having to remember all your lies instead of what the truth is. And if you spend so much time on that, that takes away from time you can spend on other things that are much more important and useful to you than remembering what story you said about something or other. So I just try to be bluntly honest with everybody and I might shape it to, to, you know, to respond to somebody else. But I, I, anyway, I, yeah, I, I, I try not to, uh, try not to tell a bunch of fibs anymore because it's, it's, it's not worth trying to remember them all. Right. I know, that sounds like I'm a big liar. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is something we talk yeah. about with students as well. Just um, a lot of our classes involve self-awareness and values and, and passions and interests, right? And just students really taking the time to get to know who they really are so that they can show up as authentically as they can in all of their interactions, right? And I think that helps with that, right? If you yep. know yourself, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be able to be a little bit more authentic than you, you would otherwise. So I think that is actually really great advice, so thank you. And then I th think also for a follow-up for Meg's question, um, she's, have you ever found yourself in a job or a posting that you regret it? And how did you handle that? Was there ever a time, um, I think you mentioned too, so moving every two to three years in your position, was there ever a posting that um, you you definitely did not want to be? And I don't know if you can speak on that a little bit. I, I have to say that there have been things, there have been aspects of every job I've ever had that I haven't liked that much. But generally speaking, there's no place that I, have wanted to really, you know, like, oh God, I can't stand it here. I need to get out. Um, so I think you just deal with it. Um, that I think uh, resilience and flexibility, and don't take yourself too seriously, and figure out how to mold your behavior to work with the other behavior. And I'm not talking about abuse, so do not confuse what I'm saying with. Uh, accepting any kind of uh, sexual abuse or anything like that. I, I'm absolutely not talking about that. But in terms of, you know, don't particularly get along with some of your colleagues. Okay, well, figure out how to get along with your colleagues. It's not that hard to do. Um, you, you, you don't have, to, you're never going to have everything that's perfect. So I think it's really important. And, and this, I'll, I'll say something about communication. I think it's really important to listen. I really like seeing people's faces. So right now being on the phone without being able to see any faces is making me very nervous. I hate this, but never mind. I'm doing it. Um, but, and that's part of being resilient. <laughs> you it out. But, yes. but uh, I think listening is more important than talking. Um, I think trying to figure out where the other person is coming from is extremely important for diplomacy, trying to figure out what can you agree on? How can you get to a place where you both agree? And, and I think that's true in a lot of situations that are not so much fun. You figure out, okay, so what can we do that we'll all think is a good thing to do? You know, we'll enjoy it together or something like that. You, how, do you, how do you make the best out of a bad situation? And when you're doing diplomacy, it, finding the area that you can agree on is really crucial. Sometimes it's, a, it's make or break. You know, if, if you can identify something that you and the person across the table, uh, you representing the U.S. and the other person can agree on, that means that you've got something. If you end up walking out without agreeing on anything, well, then that was a waste of time. And that'll be how it's seen, too. So you... It's really, really important to pay attention to who you're talking to and and what they want and and to try to think creatively about that. Thank you. Wow. I'm if you can hear me in the background, I am making notes with everything you're talking about to follow up with students. So thank you. So as everyone oh, is listening. Oh, sorry about that. I just said you're welcome. Sorry, we're we're having a gap here. It's not helping. That's all right. Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to take a moment, moment and open it up again to students if you want to turn off your mics and ask a question and engage in a conversation with, with Megan. I'm sorry, not with Megan, sorry, with Megan as well, but also with Paula. <laughs> <laughs> And for those, and, and you're all free to do that, but while we wait, we have another question, um, switching gears a little bit. Paula, you mentioned when you came into the Foreign Service in 1975, some of the changes regarding spousal uh, appointments, as well as appointments for women, and then how that's changed over time. Some students may also be aware that the Foreign Service exam has also had its own evolution with the change in, um, in these appointments as well and, and bringing women into the Foreign Service. So many students discuss uh, the Foreign Service exam, how should they prepare, prepare um, what's most important for preparing. Uh, what advice do you have for that as the exam stands right now? We know that it's had a couple of evolutions. Well, I sent Jonathan a link to a statement that the State Department made in April this year, where they have changed the uh, initial way they're going to look at the Foreign Service exam. It used to be that you took the exam and you either passed or failed. I failed it twice before I passed it. So don't anybody feel bad about not passing it if you don't pass it. Just take it. It doesn't cost anything. In fact, that's how my, my then husband ended up taking it because he found out it was free. He said, oh, if it's free, I'll take it. And then he passed it. He passed it the first time he took it. And he was only 20 or 21 at the time. Um, but I did not. I, I took it. Uh, I passed it on the third time. So big deal. Um, I think that the, for me, the most important thing was uh, I realized that they had economics questions on there with, uh, with graphs of supply and demand, and I didn't even know what the S and the D stood for on the curves on the graph. I was just totally flat-footed. So I bought myself an economics textbook and read it, and then I was able to answer the econ questions, and that's the year that I passed the exam. So for me, it was all econ. I don't know. I don't even know what the questions are these days on the Foreign Service exam. I haven't seen it in a very long time. So uh, I would say don't hesitate to, to give it a shot. Don't, don't make it seem like you're going you're gonna to work up to it and take it once. No, just take it and see, see what seems to be the hard part. But the change that the department is making is that they're going to consider not only your score on the exam, but also your I think they still call it your personal essay or your personal statement. And there, that gets into writing. And I would like to say a couple of things about writing ability. Um, it's really crucial. This, uh, the department runs on words. Diplomacy runs on words. You have to be able to put words together and to be convincing. And, uh, and you want to say things that are impactful and important. And so when you're thinking about writing your statement, your essay, whatever they're calling it, um, think it through and get other people to look at it if you want to. Um, I think it's, uh, it's important to indicate some passion, but as a, a, a boss of mine once said, Paula, don't ever use the word love in a State Department memo. <laughs> and it made me laugh, but I had said that one of these, uh, it was Mrs. Ogata, the head of UNHCR, I said, she loves something, something, something. And I just meant it as a, you know, an exaggerated thing that she really is uh, interested in. And she said, you cannot use the word love. So I would also add a door on that one. Uh, anything that sounds like it's a, a love relationship, don't use it in a, a State Department memo. The other thing is no sentence should be more than three lines long. Um, we get lots of run-on sentences, and you want to be short, uh, to the point. You want your sentences to be readable, and you don't want to make somebody read it twice. You want to be able to catch it the first time around. So be careful about your writing. Um, and that's... Yeah, I, I think the, the length of the sentence is, is really important. 
I, I know that sounds really silly, but it's not. Uh, people can't understand what you're saying if you drag it on too much. Okay, that's what yeah. I'll say about that. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, you're, I'm, I'm glad that you spoke about writing many of our students as they're preparing to apply for many of these roles. They're working on cover letters and other statements, as you mentioned, as well as resumes. And this is something that comes up a lot, right? How long do people have to read what you've sent them? And like you say, you don't want anyone to have to read something twice, right? They may not do that if they have to. So thank right. you so much. And in your resume. In your, in your resume, don't have any typos. Look at it 15 times if you have to. You do not want to send in a resume that has typos. When I see a resume where somebody didn't see that instead of writing 2022, they just wrote 202, I mean, I just think, did they not take this seriously? What, what are they thinking? Not proofing their, their resume. So be really careful about that. Um, also, Make sure that the, that the descriptions of your work in whatever it is you're talking about, and, and I don't think that the work needs to be paid. I think volunteer work, things you've done as a student where you've had a, a position in a club or in whatever it is, you can make that part of your resume if you have a clear sense of what your responsibility was and what you learned from it or what you gave to it. You know what 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 you did, what happened because of your effort. Those are crucial things. I, I think sometimes the the finishing you know over the line you know over the finish line type of uh, applicant for something will be somebody that that did something outside of work and it had a real impact because then you know that the person really is interested in doing whatever that is and and had an impact. I, I think that that can be really, um, really helpful on a, on a resume. Thank you. I hope everyone is taking notes. This is essential information. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, so I want to also to point everyone to the chat again. Thank you, Jonathan, for putting in the link that Paula was referring to um, in the chat. So you all have that. Thank you. We have another question. Okay. I'm not sure. The, okay, just let me say there were two things I sent. One was about the foreign service exam and how that's changed. And the other is the link to USA jobs because okay. uh, most of the jobs in my bureau are civil service jobs. So uh, you can go in there and, you know, with USA jobs, you can design the kind of uh, announcement, job announcements that you want to be informed of, and you can make it look uh, a certain way. You can see certain departments that you want to apply to or whatever. So I would definitely get in there and and, and put that in there as well. Sorry. Yep. Both those links are there. Thank you, Paula. Yes. Thank you, Jonathan. That's great. And thank you, Jonathan. So you all can should be able to copy and paste those links and or just click on them as well. So thank you. We have another student question. Were there things that you did to learn or adapt to different cultural expectations with such a short time in each post? And how was your level of knowledge of the local language and how has the level of knowledge of the local language impacted your experiences? That's a really good question. I mean, and the one thing, the first thing I'll say is that the Foreign Service Institute, FSI, which is part of the State Department, uh, is an excellent learning institution and they teach uh, now, they don't teach a whole lot of lo local languages. They do teach some. It depends on what you, what you call local. But um, they, they teach languages, and they also teach about the places that people are going and the type of work that one does. So uh, before I went to uh, Rwanda, I guess it was, I, had, I took the Africa course. Now, I'd already been working for a couple of years. This was 83, and I had lived in Africa, in Senegal, in the 70s as a Foreign Service wife. And I have to say, um, that was a real shock to me the first time I lived in a place where I visibly saw people that were so poor. And, and it, it was really, personally, really tough. I, I think that for the first month I was in Dakar, I cried every night. And 
I cried because I couldn't figure out how it was that I had so much and they had so little. And it just, it really tugged at me. Um, I finally figured out that I was going to have to adapt the way that I did things. And that meant that when I went to the market, I was going to give people more money than, uh, than was re required to pay for whatever it was. Not a lot more, but just rounding up. Uh, that was something that I could do to help a little bit. Um, beggars on the street, I adopted a few of them. I decided that this was my uh, street person and I was going to support him. And uh, other people, you know, I, I just, I, I figured out how to do something directly with some people to help. And I don't know if that rings true with anybody else or if they think I'm a crazy woman, but it was how I coped with the what I saw as, as really injustice, and I, I couldn't figure out what I could do about it. And there isn't much you can do about it yourself living overseas. But I adored my time in Senegal. I loved my time in Rwanda. Um, it's only two years, that's true. And I learned seeing, and I learned quickly that if you learn the, the basic greetings, you can have a you can bring a smile to a lot of faces because there are a whole lot of people who don't care. And if you do, and if you learn the the basic stuff, um, it it can work. It can build a bridge. Now that it stops after a while. You know, I could say, "How are you today? I'm fine. How is your family? They're fine. How are your children?" And then when they would ask me that, I would have to say, I don't have any children. That was in Senegal. And, and then we'd laugh because I was a woman and I didn't have any children yet. And, you know, they feel like that at the time, they felt like that was too bad. I must be, a, a, you know, incompetent or something. Anyway, um, but it, it, learning the, the local greeting, uh, local stuff is, is really important and and it's not that hard, but you do have to decide that's what you want to do. You can't, it isn't just going to happen when you get there. Does that help? How is that? Yes. And our student is uh, writing in the chat saying, yes, both strategies are insightful. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Paula, you're I have a question. Oh, thank you. We have a student. Go ahead. <laughs> so I think something that has, not necessarily turn me off to government work, but it made me a bit skeptical. Um, is like personally, um, like I struggle to do work that I don't see the direct results of, or like I just struggle to do work from a distance. I usually want to do like hands-on sort of stuff. What percentage would you say of your work, like in your career, has been hands-on, and like how much have you been able to see like the fruits of your labor? And well, how important I, is that to you? Well, it's, I would say I see the fruits of my labor all the time, but they're distant fruits. I work mostly on our overseas assistance to refugees and internally displaced persons and conflict victims in every country, every conflict in the world. We work through multilateral organizations, so the UN, the Red Cross, other organizations. Um, I see it all the time, but I see it from working one step away from it, or maybe maybe we say 10 steps away from it. I'm in Washington. I'm not in the field. I work on policy and I work on budget. And some of the policy issues that I've been able to shape uh, and I, I contribute to, it's not I'm doing this myself, but um, I've been in in looking at uh, how do we pay attention to children who are not with their parents, what we call unaccompanied children. Um, I did a, a major paper and letter to UNHCR about that in the early 90s, and it ended up that a coordinator for refugee children was hired, and they did guidelines on refugee children and cited the work that I had done as motivation to do that work. So I feel like I've had a huge uh, impact on, on policies as they've gone forward. Now, the next step is, are they actually using that policy in the field? 
And that you have to keep your eyes on that too. And that's one area I work on now. My office helps the rest of our bureau and all of our offices overseas monitor the program to make sure that we're, we're aware of where there are problems in, to go back to the children thing, you know, are there a lot of unaccompanied children that are not being taken care of? Are, for those that are identified, are efforts made to trace their parents um, and that kind of thing? There are a whole lot of issues. Unaccompanied children is just one, but there are a ton of different issues. I help work on uh, establishing standards for refugee assistance. Uh, we'd have arguments over, well, 2,000 calories is, is a daily diet, but really 1,200 can keep you alive. Well, okay, but 1,200 keeps you alive if you're lying down and not moving. If you are a refugee or if you are a, a, a conflict victim, you are probably working twice as hard as most other people. So, you know, just establishing what's the, what's the caloric intake that we need to be focused on. We didn't do that until the 90s, you know, and, and now we have uh, guidelines that are adopted by and accepted by all of the international organizations for this kind of activity. They're called the SPHERE guidelines, S-P-H-E-R-E, if you want to look it up. But they, I work on, you know, establishing that. There are things people are doing now that are new, too. It's not that everything, you know, follow us around when everything began and now it's all just uh, implementing it. That's not true at all. There's all kinds of stuff. We have uh, cash, cash assistance now. It used to be that nobody wanted to give anybody money. They only wanted to hand out things. So we'd hand out buckets and we'd hand out wash tubs and we'd hand out, you know, everything. Now we, <clears throat> we're switching a lot more is done in cash and or vouchers assistance. Um, so that's one area that's, that's new. Um, also, just the fact that people have phones now. Not everybody has a smartphone, but most everybody has a, an electronic phone. And uh, there are places in Africa that skipped right over having any phone lines up in the air. They didn't have phones before, and now all of a sudden we're on all uh, electronic, I mean, whatever you call it, uh, phones. And so you don't need to have telephone lines all over the country. Well, that's a pretty good thing, but that's, that's a different subject. But anyway, the point is uh, things are always changing. There's always a chance to make a positive difference in something. I, I feel like I'm very lucky because in the humanitarian world, you can always see that, that you've been able to do something to improve something. Now, that doesn't mean that I feel like the world is getting better because I don't. Uh, I, I say to lots of people now, because you can imagine that having worked 42 years, I'm getting closer to retirement. And I say, I'm sure glad I'm not waiting until the world is cured of war before I retire, because then I would never retire. And, you know, it's, it's not like things are better now. It, they're not. What we need right now are a lot of peacemakers. We we have too many conflicts everywhere, and we need to have some peacemakers. And where they are, maybe they're amongst some of you, come join the State Department and go make peace in some of these places. But you have to really know who you're talking to, and that goes back to my communication thing. You have to know what everybody wants and figure out how to make it, how to make things happen for everybody involved. Anyway, sorry, I, I didn't mean to throw a peacemaker at you, but um, anyway, those are those are the things. I, I feel extremely lucky, and, and again, that's why I've worked so long, because I, I feel like I have a real impact. Is that answered? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mallory, for your question. Okay. You, Paula, as well, for your answer. And, and Paula, I just want to highlight a few things that you mentioned to uh, threading together a few of your responses. Um, 
that, you know, you're a part of a larger family and a larger uh, community that continues to do this work. Um, you mentioned that, you know, your fruits are, dis you know, the fruits of your labor are distant, right? You may see these years, sometimes decades, decades down the line, um, not necessarily immediate, immediately. Um, and it's with the help of others and um, just you saying we need a lot of peacemakers and that with this is ongoing. All of this work is ongoing and everyone contributes to it in a different way. So thank you. Thank you for your good summary. Oh. <laughs> well, I know we just have a few minutes left. Um, just wanted to check really quickly if we had any more questions before we um, rounded things up with an announcement for students. Okay, I'm not seeing anything pop up. Please feel free to continue to put things in the chat or speak up. But one more question for you, um, Paula, if students were interested to learn more about your work or possibly some opportunities to get involved with the State Department or refugee work uh, for that matter, um, what would be your suggestions for them to do so um, as far as maybe getting in contact with you or anyone else? Um, I think, I think I did a, a couple of LinkedIn links with people. I don't know, are students in LinkedIn? Um, if they are, yes. feel, mm -hmm. free to, feel free to contact me that way. Um, I, I did that with some uh, after the April conference last year. So that worked out pretty well. I would say um, if you haven't gone in to explore the State Department website, I would, I would go in there and have a look um, maybe you've already done that, and I don't know how helpful it's been, but I know they have a lot of information in there that is directed at people. Um, in some decades, I'll just say one more thing. In some decades, the department has wanted to hire more experienced people, and in some decades, they've wanted to just get people on board as quickly as possible. Um, it started that, well, the 9-11 made us hire a whole bunch of people all of a sudden. So all of a sudden we were hiring people uh, really quickly out of school. But before that, in the 90s, they, were, they had really started to look at people who had uh, overseas experience or advanced degrees or whatever. But as I mentioned to you, when I, when I joined the Foreign Service as a Foreign Service wife, I was only 21 and my husband was only 22. So it does vary by time. And I know that over, uh, over the past couple of years, we've lost a lot of uh, people. And so, and I mean by their retiring or quitting, I don't mean uh, death. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there, there is a, a pretty big hiring surge going on right now. So I encourage people to, you know, to take that exam, see what's going on, apply for jobs. You know, there's a very good way to, get, you know, involved in international stuff um, through the civil service, too. So I encourage that. Does that help? Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to answer your question okay. from before, students are on LinkedIn, and we encourage them to be on LinkedIn. So I hope everyone heard that as well, to reach out to Paula on LinkedIn. Thank you. Great. I think, Heather, did you have one more uh, announcement for students before we head off? Hi, yes. Actually, I did want to tell you about um, the State Department website. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick if I have that power. Jonathan, do I have the power? Yes, I do. So here is um, state.gov. And if you know, if you scroll down, it always has news um, from the different um, sections, different offices that are working within the State Department. But there's also a section where you can sign up to get email updates. Um, and in that uh, section, you can choose, like, do you want to get um, updates from uh, USAID, the Office of Finance, um, from the Secretary of State, they put out, um, his office puts out various statements. So you can choose what news you want to get directly to your email. And then, uh, and I found this to be really, really useful because you will also get information, you know, obviously there's a section for job seekers and there's information about um, uh, internships as well. 
Um, another uh, resource we have is our diplomat in residence. Let's see if I can find that. Hang on just a minute. Anyway, he is um, recently, uh, they, he has been, um, our diplomat in residence has had a turnover and it's Louis Ventor, who was actually the diplomat in residence before um, Shannon Farrell last year. So uh, I've put that um, link in here, careers.state.gov, uh, and our, we're in the North Central region. You can always reach out to your diplomat in residence, like if it's either here in Indiana or um, like your home state. And a lot of them have office hours that you can make appointments with them to discuss careers, internships, um, strategy for the you know uh, foreign service application um, because the the uh, the exam is no longer um, a gateway you know so it's the whole application now they are making a concerted effort to uh, recruit a, a younger crowd and a more diverse um, group uh, to the State Department so I think our students um, have these really great tools, right? So you can reach out to Paula, you can reach out to the diplomat in residence, you can get news from the State Department, you know, all of their different divisions to see what you're most interested in. Um, and of course, you can always ask us um, here at HLS as well. So um, we, we are hoping to bring um, Louis Ventor to our campus soon to do some workshops and um, like on the exam and on, uh, internships, um, heads up, the, uh, the paid internships, the notice comes out very quickly on those. So you need to have like your whole application together and basically ready to upload by the time the call comes out because you'll have maybe five days at the most to get it in there. But they do have paid internships and they have a lot of opportunities for you. Could I, uh, could I say yeah. one more thing? Sure. Sorry. Um, we've, we've just converted and all of our internships are paid now. We do not oh, have great. any volunteers. They're all paid. And I should have mentioned that a long time ago. That's a really, really good way to see whether you like it or not. We do have also uh, virtual internships and we started that during COVID. I, that's not quite the same, you know, obviously mm -hmm. as being able to come into work and see things. But we have so many people that are uh, that are working remotely or, or teleworking that um, that even the even the internship in in the office is not it's not the same as the olden days, but it's better than nothing. And it and we in my office we have somebody in every single day. So um, I think I think internships are fabulous uh, on both sides usually. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. I should have. Oh, great. No worries. I know actually you were instrumental in um, some of our students getting internships last year. So um, we're always grateful Yay. for your participation and your engagement with us. Excellent. And Paul, I know you cannot see our chat, but we just wanted to let you know that students are uh, saying thank you for sharing your experience and appreciating your talk. Well, that's very sweet. I, I hope it was useful, even if, if it's just one sentence out of what I said. Uh, I, I hope it's useful and I hope that we'll get some more internships and maybe some more people passing the exam. That would be wonderful. That would be great. Well, thank you, Paula, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Heather and Jonathan, for making sure we could all engage with Paula. And thank you to students who have come online and who are also uh, in person together in one of our, our classrooms uh, listening to this as well. Um, hopefully, we all can stay in touch. Um, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. I'm over at the Walter Center if you have any questions and would like to get some practice with some of the tests and prep uh, when you're applying for internships or full-time positions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, Paula. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.